Hi everyone, Drew Perot here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. On today's episode, we have Dr. David Perlmutter and his son, Dr. Austin Perlmutter, here to talk to us about cleansing our brains. How do we detoxify our brains to have deeper relationships and actually make better decisions in life? They're here to talk to us about their new book, Brainwash. It's a fascinating conversation for anybody who's interested in wanting to make better decisions, wanting to be healthier, but not exactly sure how to get started. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast, where we dive deep into the topics of neuroplasticity, epigenetics, mindfulness, functional medicine, and mindset, all with the goal of helping you understand how your brain is not broken. I'm your host, Drew Prode, and each week my team and I bring on a new guest or guest plural who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and live more. This week's guests are board-certified neurologist and four-time New York Times best-selling author, Dr. David Perlmutter, and his son, who's also joining us here in Santa Monica in our studio, Dr. Austin Perlmutter, board-certified internal medicine physician, and together, they're the co-authors of the all-new book, which is out this week. Please go get it. You will not regret it. Brainwash, detox your mind for clear thinking, deeper relationships, and most importantly, lasting happiness. Gentlemen, welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. Delighted to be here. Thanks for having us. I want to just say, as somebody who works with his family, my uh, my business partner is Dr. Mark Hyman, but my sister's in the company, my aunt's in the company, my dad is helping us. He's retired, but he's helping us launch this new venture that we're doing. It just music to my ears and eyes to see you guys writing a book together. Before we jump into it, what was that process like, father and son working on a book together? Well, we've already jumped into it. So. <laughs> uh, you want to start, Austin? Sure. Well, this is a, it's been straight up one of the most meaningful experiences of my life. And I really can't emphasize that enough. Getting to know my dad in this context is so different from turning to a, a father for general advice. We've been doing the science together, waking up in the morning, drinking several cups of coffee, sitting down at the table, looking over these studies and having this intellectual connection that has been absolutely phenomenal. But on the other hand, the interpersonal dynamic of being able to work with somebody I care about so much on a message that I believe is going to be so helpful to so many people has been the other really key aspect of this. And honestly, I knew it was going to be a big deal. Writing a book I've always heard is a huge process, but it has been really, I don't want to say easy, but wonderful throughout. And I would tell you that uh, when you have your son who thinks that dad's cool enough that he wants to hang out with him, that's pretty, pretty exciting. But we, we've done that for years. And uh, whether it's playing Frisbee golf at night with lighted Frisbees or who knows what, we've done a lot of stuff together over the years. Now this becomes, you know, an, an incredible project with a huge goal. Uh, truthfully, the, the messaging of our book evolved in the process of writing the book. Uh, what uh, promulgated the original idea was both of us being physicians and working with patients doing the very best we can to learn as much information as is possible then imparting that information to the patient and then experiencing an incredible level of frustration because the patient then doesn't implement that information so we wanted to design the initial plan was to design the bridge between information and action. So that caused us then to evaluate where the breakdown happens. Why is it that people can know what is the best decision to make and yet they don't do that? And you know, we as physicians and I think in general, people tend to point fingers and say, what's wrong with that person who's making bad decisions? Why don't they uh, eat less carbohydrates or whatever the, the goal may be? And I think that what we learned through the research that we've done for Brainwash is that there are many trappings of our modern society, our modern world, uh, that really stacks the deck against you being able to make better decisions. So, yeah, there's great information out there. You know, there are plenty of authors writing great books and, uh, you know, we have them on our shelves, books by everybody. You know, my books, I think, carry good information. Dr. Hyman's putting out amazing information. But what we've realized is that these books and programs are useless unless they are implemented. What good does it do to have the information? So we've spent a year really doing the deep dive into how people make decisions. 
which then overrides all of the rest of the information that's out there, finally allowing people to rein in first the influences that are present in our modern world that are corroding their ability to make these good decisions. And then more importantly, once it's recognized how to fix that so that people can be satisfied, can look in the mirror and realize their goals, realize their weight loss, their whatever it is that their goal may be. So I want to piggyback off of what you said. I want to read a passage, a sentence from the book. Our brains are being gravely manipulated, resulting in behaviors that leave us more lonely, anxious, depressed, distressful, illness prone, and overweight than ever before. So you talked about those two aspects, which is how do we help and support people to actually make these decisions and implement change in their life to achieve to achieve whatever goal that they want to focus on. But let's start off with what is actually hijacking our brain that it makes it difficult to do so. Can you describe the landscape landscape and the state of threats that our brains are under today? Sure. Well, let's start with one of the most important and probably most straightforward of these. It's food. We need food. We need to eat food to keep going. But what is it that we're putting into our bodies? Well, a recent study showed that 68% of the foods that people eat and buy in the store have added sugar. We know sugar isn't really a good thing for us, but the question has to be, what is it doing to our thinking? What is it doing to our brains? And this is the question that I think we're now able to answer, but we haven't been looking into nearly enough. What is sugar doing to our brains? Well, sugar fosters inflammation, which listeners know is not good for the body. Chronic inflammation has been implicated in a variety of problems, things like heart disease, things like Alzheimer's disease. What we're understanding now is that inflammation, this process that sugar upregulates, changes our thinking. So let's let that sink in. It's not that it changes our thinking in the long run. It changes our thinking right now. Inflammation has been shown in several recent trials to bias our decision making towards short term impulsive thinking. So to put that into context, if you're eating a diet that increases inflammation, you're going to make more short-term oriented decisions, like eating a diet that increases inflammation, choosing the wrong foods to be eating. And that transcends just diet, it gets into other things. If you're somebody who struggles with online shopping, now you have a diet that increases inflammation, you're going to be picking the short-term reward, and that means your, your shopping cart might be filling up online with things that you don't need. So again, food is one of those entry points. It's something that has been made incredibly palatable over the years, and while that means it might taste good, we need to appreciate that it is activating these circuits within our bodies, within our brains, that are making our decisions more impulsive, more short-term oriented, and in the big picture, taking us away from the decisions that will lead us to health and will lead us to happiness. And let me add, uh, before we move on from food, and uh, because... It is, um, it is a very important topic because we, we recognize that in a simplistic model, there are two areas of the brain that are involved in decision making. The prefrontal cortex, which is the more advanced area, if I may, and the more primitive, if I may, amygdala. And, you know, there's a balance between the two. Uh, we tend to, uh, with inflammation, unfortunately have more input from the primitive amygdala and as such our decisions are not really looking at the future as opposed to if we can reconnect to the prefrontal cortex and that is the area of the brain that allows us to uh, participate in a process of thinking of the long-term consequences of our actions today. It allows us to be more empathetic. It allows us to be more compassionate. It helps to tamp down this sense of us versus them. That comes from the amygdala. So we're trying to reconnect to the prefrontal cortex. And you know, as per our discussion of food and inflammation, inflammation absolutely threatens that connection. And I have to say that uh, a thought came to me this morning while in the shower. Some of my best thoughts come to me in the shower. <laughs> and having read the New York Times this morning, they had an interesting article about what's going on in Brazil with reference to deforestation in the Amazon. Not a good thing, I think most people would agree with that. Uh, But that said, what has happened to the uh, thought process around the globe uh, is influenced by the globalization of the Western pro-inflammatory diet. That as this Western diet 
uh, finds its way to every corner of the globe, it's changing how people across our planet think and behave, locking them more into short-term reward-based decision-making and away from long-term consequence-based thinking and being empathetic towards their neighbor, towards their future selves, towards the planet. So it... Uh, our discussion just about food could take us, you know, hours and hours, and that would be actually a good thing. But and so in a way, you're almost saying just to like break it down very clearly, like sugar and other processed foods. Which you talk to most people, and they say, "I don't really eat sugar. I'm not eating sugar." But Andrew, it's in our food. It's in everything already. It's already in your pasta sauce, and it's already in so many of the health products that you're getting. Even if it's pure cane sugar or other stuff, it's so pervasive that's there. This is encouraging the the factor of inflammation, the cycle of inflammation in the body, and that can even make you more selfish, it's more exactly aggressive. It's exactly what Austin said, and that is that uh, you know it's actively added. And this is not a conspiracy theory. We know that the statistics indicate that around 68% of the 1.2 million foods sold in the grocery store have added sweetener. That's, you know, I don't know if we can ever say that's a fact. Somebody may say, no, the world is flat. But it's, you know, if you take the foods and you look at them, you look at the labels, that's what you see. Now, you might not see sugar. You might see a high fructose corn syrup or, uh, you know, people think that, well, maybe it's okay because it's cane sugar or it came from... Uh, organically raised honeybees or or maple syrup that was grown on trees that people prayed around or whatever. It's sugar and it is pro-inflammatory and it is distancing your ability to make good decisions. Mm. You know, this is part of a larger theme that's inside of the book of the new normal that's there. Can you talk to us about the new normal, the new reality that we find ourselves in today? Food is one part of that, but there's a greater topic that's part of that too. Yeah, that's, that's such a good point. So where are we at? Where are we at where we're living in the United States today? Well, 70 plus percent of American adults are overweight or obese. 60 plus percent of American adults suffer from a chronic disease. Rates of anxiety are around 18 percent in American adults. Rates of depression are somewhere around 6 percent, but seem to be increasing in both adults and children. Things don't need to be this way because a lot of these are preventable diseases. And I don't want to say all of it, but we have these solutions, meaning we know certain diets, for example, the Mediterranean diet is linked to a lower risk of developing depression. We know that exercise is linked to a lower risk of developing depression. We know that we can spend time with other people and that improves our health outcomes, including our mood. So we have kind of these solutions. Now, why that's so important is, as we mentioned before, it's not the question of do we know what to do? It's a question of do we know how to follow through on these things we understand? And so the world as we see it right now could be a lot better with the available information. So much of these things are things that are a result of poor decision making. And again, to give the example, with the sugar, if you're somebody who is you know that you shouldn't be drinking a whole bunch of soda, you know that you shouldn't be eating a whole bunch of white bread, but you do it anyway, it's not a knowledge problem anymore. It's a problem with being able to follow through on the decisions. And those decisions are a reflection of the way our brains are wired. So to take this to where we wanna go in the book, we need to get upstream. We need to get upstream of the time that you're sitting there looking at the apple and the donut and thinking, I know I should eat the apple, but the donut looks really good. At that point, a lot of the decision has already been made because it's determined by the way your brain is wired. We talk about inflammation. Inflammation changes our decisions. It changes our mood. It changes our entire outlook on life. And as an example of that, we now understand that inflammation may actually cause depression. And I'll take a pause there because it's something that I only recently fully grasped the significance of this, this point. We look at research where they give people either vaccinations or endotoxin, which is a part of a, a bacterial membrane, and it creates symptoms of depression, which means people feel more withdrawn from others. It means they don't want to go socialize. It means they don't enjoy life as much. So inflammation, we, we appreciate it, changes our brain. But again, as I said before, if we know that inflammation is changing our decisions, and we know that our decisions can alter the amount of inflammation in our bodies, then we can get upstream of this by making the choices today, things like 
exercising, things like meditating, things like even going out into nature for 20 minutes that lowers stress. And when you have lower stress, that lowers inflammation over time. These are ways we can take back our brain for better decisions and better outcomes. You know, uh, I, I was thinking of a couple things as, as we were, as Austin was talking. And uh, the first was, there's a great quote uh, when Luke Skywalker first uh, uh, first meets Yoda. I mean, we get our information wherever we get it, right? <laughs> and Yo, uh, Luke is beca- wants to become a Jedi, and uh, he's learning how to use the lightsaber, and he's not doing a really good job. And he's uh, Yoda says, "Well, you've got to, you've got to do, do, do not <laughs> That's is do." That's a pretty whatever. good impression, right so, there. So. Uh, he, uh, he says, well, I'm trying. And Yoda says, try. What is try? There is only do and not do. So that's I- interesting. You know, I'm thinking about that in the context of this book, Brainwash. Uh, this is for the people who look in the mirror and say, why is this happening? Why can't I make these decisions? I bought the gym membership. Why am I not going? Why am I not getting the outcome that I want? And I think that the deck is stacked against people and they don't realize it, that because of these hacks into their decision making, as we've now been talking about with respect to sugar, uh, there's many other hacks and, and we'll talk about that, but uh, it's, it's time that people stop fully blaming themselves and gaining this recognition that their ability to make and stick with better decisions has been taken from them by, as we've talked about now, sugar via inflammation, via disconnection to the prefrontal cortex. That's what inflammation does. So Austin started off first with food. David, can you pick up on that? You were talking about these other hacks. What are the other hacks that are there that are hijacking our ability to move forward on the things that we actually care about? Well, so many things, and it's, you know, truthfully, many of the lifestyle choices that you've talked about and interviewed people about uh, over the years with reference to their general health. I would say that what is thematic about basically everything that we present is the mechanism of inflammation. Yes, the same mechanism underlying chronic degenerative conditions, but now recognizing that chronic inflammation is part of disconnection syndrome, is keeping you from accessing that part of your brain that allows you to plan for the future, make good decisions, stick with your decisions, and even express empathy. That is a powerful threat posed by inflammation brought on, for example, by not getting enough restorative sleep. You know, So in a way, if I could just interrupt, there's all these different streams that are out there, little rivers, that then lead into this bigger river. So it could be these not getting enough sleep, not getting enough food or getting the wrong types of food that are there, all going into that main river of inflammation, all contributing to it. Yes, and we're gonna revisit that metaphor a little bit later because it allows us to get out of the main river into the smaller uh, tributaries if we uh, just choose, for example, to change the diet, to pay attention to our exercise, time in nature, relationships, meditation, sleep, et cetera. So, uh, you know, everybody doesn't have to be put off by the idea that, well, I got to jump in uh, full bore here and do this entire uh, lifestyle change immediately. No. Once you change a couple of these parameters, then the decision making apparatus improves and that will foster making more and more changes. Ultimately, the whole program is on board and, and people are really finally achieving a place of being satisfied with their decisions and knowing that their decisions are taking them to a better place. Now, we were introducing sleep. You know, we talk about um, how much time do you spend uh, exercising? How much time do you spend meditating? How much time uh, do you spend engaging with other people? Uh, Those time dedications pale in relationship to the amount of time you spend or should spend sleeping. You don't spend a third of your day Uh, eating or exercising, unless you're training for some ultra something or other. But you spend or should spend about seven or eight hours, a third of your 24-hour clock uh, sleeping. It's that important. And yet we now know that a third of Americans don't get enough sleep, don't get adequate sleep. And, you know, it it, it dovetails nicely what Austin was describing earlier uh, with respect to food, Uh, that the same sort of findings are seen when people are not getting enough restorative sleep. Their decision-making apparatus is dysfunctional. They make bad decisions. As an example, uh, people who chronically are not getting enough restorative sleep 
have an average increased consumption daily of 350 calories added without any added caloric burn. So that's a net 350 more on the scale of where you don't need those calories. And when you consider that 3,500 calories is a pound of body fat, it doesn't take much imagination to think about somebody who's chronically not getting enough sleep over six to eight months to a year, there's going to be a lot of weight gain. And that is a problem because that's fat gain. And there is a powerful association between increasing body fat and worse sleep. So that is a feed forward, no well, pun intended, feed forward cycle where you're not sleeping well, you're gaining weight, and guess what? You're not sleeping well. And body fat is pro-inflammatory. And uh, Austin, as he described in the book, tell us about the body fat and, and our appetite, for example. Sure, this is something that was a relatively shocking thing when I finally understood, and that is what do our fat cells do? What do specifically our visceral fat cells do? The fat cells that we find around our belly, for example. And research has shown us that they produce chemicals. What do those chemicals do? Well, they influence our brains. They change the way we think. They change the way we make decisions. So the way I look at this is our adipocytes, our fat cells, they have this agenda. They don't want to be killed off. They want to survive. And how do they do that? Well, they tell our brains, you should be making short-term decisions. And so what we see is that BMI is correlated with higher BMI means more short-term decision-making. So again, thinking about this, your fat cells, they've got their agenda, and that is staying alive, not being destroyed by good decision-making. So they are influencing your brain to tell you, keep doing the things, eating the foods, not exercising, that will keep us going. And they all seem like such small things when you look at them individually. Oh, what's one night's sleep? Oh, right. what's a little bit of sugar? But what you both are really laying out is yeah. the effect that they have on each other. And this is how people get down a downward sp yes, spiral. Yes, it's a great point, Drew. And that is that even one night of uh, whatever it may be, bad decision making, uh, not sleeping, or one day of, of bad eating, uh, in the aggregate, maybe it's not a big deal, but it does tend to set things up. Let's spin that even one week of getting better sleep, even one week of making sure you exercise every day or committing to, as we describe, a 10-day plan where you're going to meditate every day for 10 days, that is, in using your metaphor, a tributary into the, the river, an entree, if you will, to really ultimately allow uh, better decision-making. And it, you know, uh, this discussion about body fat has, another pun, huge implications. Why? You know, as Austin was saying, you know, our, our fat cells seem to have their own agenda. Fat controls the levels of the hunger hormone, uh, ghrelin, which makes us eat more, and therefore we nurture our fatness. And these, it's like cancer cells that increase uh, angiogenesis, the growth of new blood vessels, and suppress the immune response around the cancer. To keep them, they have their agenda, they want to survive, though they kill the host. Uh, with all due respect, fat cells are doing the same thing. They will ultimately kill the host. We know uh, that it's far more than a cosmetic issue, that visceral fat in particular, as, as Austin described, does uh, you know, increase inflammation and as such is associated with chronic degenerative conditions. And that's the number one cause of death on planet Earth. And when we look at each other with the fact floating in the air right now that for the, for the second year in a row, longevity in America is declining. Man, that's, uh, we, we've got to, we got to re redo some things here. We've got to get out some information that transcends giving people just uh, the idea that you need to eat this, don't eat that, and life is going to be good. No, we got to address why it is that they're not making that decision in the first place. I want to come back to something that you said, David, which was you were talking about how when individuals don't get proper night's rest, how it increases their hunger. A lot of people that are listening now, they would think, okay, if I'm not getting a good night's rest, I'm just a little bit more tired. But either one of you, could you explain like what is that mechanism that's actually happening in the body from what we know of so far that would link poor sleep to actually being more hungry the next day? Well, I'd say there are two fundamental mechanisms that we talk about in brainwash, one being the connection between the reward system and the prefrontal cortex, and the other being the connection between a part of the limbic system called the amygdala 
and the prefrontal cortex. And it seems that both are activated in a, a bad way, let's say, by sleep deficit. So we're more likely to choose those short-term rewards because our reward system is changed when we don't get enough sleep. I think we better understand what's going on with the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex with what happens with sleep deficit. And this probably additionally contributes to what we have been talking about, which is why we choose the short-term reward. The amygdala is also linked into that reward circuit. And so what we see is that under conditions of sleep deficit, even as short as one night, there is an increased activation of the amygdala in response to threatening images. There's also, in response to a couple of nights of sleep deprivation, less connection between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. Now, why does that matter? Well, the amygdala is not a good or bad thing. It's something that has provided us amazing benefit, especially in days gone by and now in the current moment as well. But it's a threat response system. And when we don't get enough sleep, that amygdala is left to fire on its own. We become more sensitive to threats. We're we, trigger happy. <laughs> exactly. I, I think of it kind of as an alarm system, right? It tells us when something might be going wrong. And the prefrontal cortex has to come over and say, hey, don't worry about it. Things are okay. And maybe adjust the sensitivity. But when that connection between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala is broken down, which is what happens under conditions of sleep deficit, then you have this alarm blaring in the background all the time. Your stress response is constantly going off. When that happens, you increase cortisol, you increase other hormones, and it puts you in a position where you're more likely to make short-term decisions. From an evolutionary perspective, this actually makes sense. When you're under a condition of stress, which in our past would have been more of an acute stress as opposed to a chronic stress, you need to make a quick decision. You don't want to be sitting there thinking about what will the weather look like three days from now. You're thinking about how do I get away from the saber-toothed tiger this moment. But when you're sitting there for hours, for days, for months, and for some people for years, your decision making is going to stay in that short-term focus. And what does that mean? Well, you're going to be making those impulsive decisions like eating those extra calories. The unfortunate thing with sleep deficit is we see this happening after one night. So that one night staying up late, watching Netflix, look, I get it, Netflix is wonderful, but it comes at a cost, and that cost is better decisions. I wanna zoom out for a second and talk about this term that you guys have coined, which is disconnection syndrome, and help us understand what it is and how everything we've talked about fits into the context of this term. Well, a syndrome, by definition, is, uh, it constitutes a lot of nuances. So it means we can use this term disconnection syndrome in a very uh, literal way and a very figurative way. In a very literal way, it's exactly what Austin's been talking about, disconnection between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, keeping the adult out of the room, basically leaving the kids at home for the weekend with 30 of their closest friends while mom and dad go on a cruise. Bad idea. We need to have the parents at home to help make the decisions. What to eat, when to go to bed, all the things that happen. That's what we are disconnected from. The ability to make uh, good decisions, to plan for the future, to act compassionately towards other people, to embrace empathy. So in the strictest sense of our application of this new term, disconnection syndrome, that's what we refer to. But in the broader sense, it is a disconnection that is induced upon us because we're disconnecting, for example, from the messaging of our DNA. When we eat fruits that are not um, what our DNA is used to seeing, we increase inflammation, we enhance uh, free radical stress, we compromise detoxification. So we're disconnecting from these pathways in our genome that are set up to keep us healthy. You know, that's sort of one of the fundamentals of the so-called paleo movement, to kind of honor uh, our paleolithic genome and allow it to express itself. We disconnect from the messaging of our microbiome. We do so by eating foods that are not good for us, taking various medications that are threatening the microbiome. We're disconnecting from these life-sustaining signals and metabolites that our gut bacteria are producing to keep us healthy. Uh, and even more broadly, because of all this happening, because of our disconnection from the prefrontal cortex, then we are disconnecting from each other. We are disconnecting from personal interaction. We are disconnecting from conceiving of the future and disconnecting from our concern over even the health of the planet. So 
our m- main mission in Bra- uh, Brainwash is reconnection on all of the levels that just were presented. Most importantly, reconnecting to that part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, which is our gift. You know, that and having an opposable thumb really kind of define us in terms of being different from other animals. I mean, a third of the brain cortex is prefrontal cortex. In uh, in chimpanzees, I think it's 17%. It's a much lower number. So it's not that it's not represented in other primates or other mammals, but we've got this incredible ability to plan for the future, to make better decisions. And, uh, you know, the, the revelation for us that so many aspects of our modern life, like our digital experiences, for example, are tending to pull us away from connecting to the prefrontal cortex and locking us into that part of the brain that is far more involved with short-sightedness and narcissism. I want to talk about digital experiences because that was one part of the book that I was very fascinated to see some of the research that you talked about there. So you were mentioning inside the book about the ever rising level of concern around increasing internet usage and some of the studies that are out there. Austin, what can you tell us about what we know about the internet and over usage and its implications on the brain? Well, I want to make it a clear point here that Technology is not a bad thing. Technology is a wonderful thing. And when we were researching this book, we were able to access studies that have been published on every corner of the earth because of technology. Even cell phones, wonderful thing. I was able to FaceTime with my dad when I was out in Oregon and he was in Florida. The point we have to make here though is, what are we doing with this technology? Are we using it or is it using us? And as you mentioned, Almost 70% of the world's population already has a smartphone, and these numbers are projected to continue increasing. So why does all this matter so much? Well, we can get stuck with our technology, where it's taking us away from the things that we know are linked to lasting health, to lasting happiness. For example, the in-person, interpersonal uh, interpersonal interactions that we have with other people. This isn't to say that video chatting is a bad thing. It's to say, what are we doing if we spend several hours on social media blindly scrolling through other people's feeds? What we talk about in the book is that there's a need to have a better approach to this. There's a need for an approach where we can use technology and benefit from us, but not or benefit from it, but not have all these consequences happen. Consequences like becoming more disconnected from other people. Consequences like becoming more polarized against other people's opinions. Things that take away from our overall quality of life and I would say on a larger picture of the world are taking us away from seeing the similarities that we share as opposed to looking at these differences that become so glaring when you watch the news or go on social media. We came up with this tool called TIME. It's an acronym and it stands for the following. First, T, time limited, time restricted. When you're going online, when you're watching TV, even if you're listening to the radio or going on your cell phone, you wanna set a window where you feel comfortable spending that time. So let's say you wanted to watch a TV show. The TV show is 30 minutes. You set a timer for 30 minutes, and when that timer goes off, you're done. So time restricted. I is intentional. You wanna be intentional about what you're trying to do. I can say that I've had experiences where all of a sudden I find myself on Instagram. I don't really remember how I got there. It's kinda like when you're driving in a car and all of a sudden you realize you went 30 miles and don't exactly know where you've been going. So intentional, have a purpose to what you're trying to do. If you wanna go on online and check in with a friend, do that thing, but set it out beforehand so you don't find 10 minutes later you're out checking out some conspiratorial sites. How about M? Well, M is mindful. That means when you're engaging with your digital technology, you wanna be mindful of what's happening. How are you feeling? When you start watching the news because you wanna be informed, do you find yourself feeling really stressed, which is actually now that news is so negative, a common occurrence. If you're feeling stressed, is it actually a benefit to you anymore? Are you, are you still learning something from watching that news or is it just detracting from your overall quality of life? And then E is for enriching. This may be the most important part of it. I like to think any interaction I have should be enriching my life in some way or another. And when you put yourself in a digital world, there's a high chance that your attention is going to be sucked into some black hole or another. You're gonna find yourself uh, watching a whole bunch of videos that 
added absolutely nothing to your life. You might find yourself reading comments on some sort of hateful post. You might find yourself watching three hours of reality TV. And I'm not saying that reality TV is bad. I'm saying, how does that improve your quality of life? And so you want to make sure that it's enriching. And I think a great place to start is after you've had a digital experience, you'll kind of know. You can, you can pause and say, was that a net benefit in my life? And if not, that's the time to look at it and to make some changes. I think you make an important point is that these apps are, and there's great things from them. I've met so many friends. People are listening to us using some app that's out there. But they've been designed to hijack your attention exactly right and you know this isn't conspiracy theory we know that the pop-up ads that appear when you're online are designed for exactly what drew was interested in last week so it's we're not talking about something that people don't know about that the next youtube video that's queued up happens to be similar to the last one but kind of maybe nuanced by where you were a week ago so you know it, it it's it's reality the the other point i think is that uh, especially as it relates to the t of of the test of time that Austin was talking about is, you know, we know that uh, the average American spends six hours or more in front of a screen of one sort or another every single day, which in the average lifetime will add up to 22 years spent in front of a screen. And, you know, the implications of that in terms of the blue light, the digital experience, the corrupting of your brain, another discussion, what I want to bring up right now is when you're doing one thing, you're not doing something else. So that is valuable time that you could have been uh, outside. You could have been having personal relationships with other people. Uh, you could have been exercising. You could have been shopping, planning your meal, building your meal, you know, con constructing the meal with other people, and really engaged in the things that we all know are going to be, to use Austin's word, net positive. So just that uh, the amount of time that is being dedicated you know, it's been estimated that about 6% of the world's population suffers from internet addiction. And that is, you know, being on the internet so much that it, it grossly interferes with your life engagement. So that's a, it's a big number. We know that adolescents who are uh, overly involved in social media actually have demonstrable changes in their brains, have reduction in the corpus callosum. That's the white matter pathway connecting the right and left hemispheres to each other. And we don't know what the implications are of, of that change in the brain, but it's probably not a good thing to suddenly start disconnecting. You know, it's another part of disconnection syndrome. I never thought of that before, of disconnecting one hemisphere from the other because they're connected, obviously, for an important reason. And again, finally, we, we, we love digital technology. I mean, it allows, it allows us to do amazing things, but we have to put this into context of our overall 24-hour experience. You know, so much of behavior change, and you guys are physicians, so you're always working with patients and trying to help them is, okay, there, there's what you can cut out and there's what you can add in. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people get stuck because, okay, I'm gonna take those things out of spending as much time on the internet, but they don't know, sometimes we've forgotten about what to add in. It kind of goes back to this, the rat model, the mice model, where we've heard this term of like cocaine is, uh, sugar is as, of, as addictive as cocaine. But when they took that same model of, of the mice and they put them in sort of a rat colony where there was a lot of things to do and so many other things, they found that sugar is not as addictive. So personalize it for us in your own lives, each one of you, how do you find that time for connection? What does it really look like that can give our listeners inspiration for what they can add in to give them more options to actually connect? Well, you know, people tend to uh, fill their days uh, with one thing or another. If there's free time, it somehow gets filled. And I, I think the point that we really want to make, uh, and we talk about so much in Brainwash, is that there are some activities that are powerfully net positive, that are geared specifically at reestablishing that connection, offsetting disconnection syndrome, reestablishing connection to the prefrontal cortex. And these are things that we don't want to find time for. We don't want to find time for exercise. We don't want to find time, for example, for meditation. We want to make time. And the difference is finding time is kind of low priority. Making time for these things is much higher priority. So if we slot in a given amount of time each day that is uh, un undeniable, it's part of the schedule for our exercise, for meditation, then those times of day cannot be uh, uh, utilized for mindless time online or filled by use, doing something that's not really net positive. The E 
uh, in, in, as Austin described, in the time acronym? Is it enriching for you? Meditation is enriching. Uh, physical exercise is clearly enriching. Re uh, personal relationships, being with other people, reconnecting with people is enriching. Nature exposure is positive. So it's all about the triage, isn't it? It's about, um, you know, ranking these activities. And unfortunately, slowly but surely, the mindless time spent in front of the screen works its way up to being, you know, as mentioned, six hours of your day for the average American. So it's got to be put much, much lower. And we have to recognize that it's a great tool, but we have to contextualize that. And on a personal level, when you think about your schedule for the week, on a week that let's say you're not traveling or on a week that you are traveling out here doing interviews in Los Angeles, is it a little bit like meal prep? You think about it on like the weekend and look at your week ahead and slot in those times. Do you have it automatic in your routine? How have you made these activities that you love to do and that bring you towards connection? How do you make them a reality as part of your week on like a scheduling basis? Well, everyone who's involved uh, in looking at what our schedule demands and primarily that's people to know, but in the studio, Andrew Lure. Uh, he knows darn well that we need to meditate every day and that we need to have good food and that there's got to be time for exercise. So here we are uh, far from home. We, we live in Florida. Here we are in California. And every morning has been exercise, uh, meditation uh, in the hotel room. Uh, you, you know, we do our very best to find the very best food that's available. These are on the top of the list. And we love you, but you're below those things in terms of what matters. Uh, those are the life-sustaining choices that we make that are the non-negotiable. So then the other things that we do as part of what we do in our lives, you know, the vocational things are important, but truly uh, making those priorities uh, enhances this moment with you. And communicating with other people. So many times Absolutely. when people feel guilty, I'll ask them, okay, let's start at like number one. Have you told even if you don't have a team and you're not an author or a thought leader, let's just say somebody that has a family. Have you told your wife that this is a priority for you? Have you told your husband that this is a priority for you? Have you communicated with your work that, hey, listen, I'll take that early morning call, but then I go to the gym and then I come back. And I often hear that people feel guilty because they haven't even told people yet. So now they're doing that activity sometimes and they get a call from somebody or an interruption and it pulls them away from that. So even communicating, as you were hinting to earlier, is such a key part of that. Austin, what have you... Wait, wait, let me get, yes. get back to... That's a decision. Yes. It's making that decision, which is what we're all about here. It's making the commitment and working... The first step is working on the decision-making apparatus, working on increasing your ability then, to, not only just to recognize what's good for you, but then to commit to doing it. On the topic of community because it's such a big topic. And I mean, in the subtitle of the actual book, you have lasting happiness, deeper relationships. Deeper relationships is about connection. How on a practical level does it show up in your life? And how do you make it a priority? I, I think it's, it's a lot easier to talk about all of these things if you have all of your days free. And for a lot of listeners, that's not going to be the case. You're gonna be busy at work, you're gonna be doing things. So it's a question of how do you build these things in? And for me, that was most relevant when I was in residency. I was sometimes in the hospital 80 or so hours a week. And so there weren't all these extra windows where I could spend several hours meditating. And so I'll say, first of all, nature, that was my way of reconnecting. I would go out into the woods and then you- By yourself with by others. By myself a lot of the by time. Yourself. And I'm a big proponent of doing this with other people. But for me, that was the meditation piece. It was the exercise piece. It was going out into the middle of nowhere in the gloomy, gloomy Pacific Northwest winters, which I love, don't get me wrong, but walking around these trees and just having the time to decompress. And we know that nature lowers levels of stress, so that makes a lot of sense. I wanted to make a point with regard to how do you get yourself to start doing these things? And one of the problems that we have is that the barrier to open your phone, to opening your phone and opening an app is so low. If you're sitting there and there's that moment of discontent, you take out your phone, you see what your friends are up to on social media, and the whole process is over before you even thought about it. Why that is important is if you want to start making positive lifestyle changes, and that might be going to the gym, that might be spending time with your friends, realize it's not going to be as easy as that right off the bat. 
And that's why, as you mentioned, scheduling these things out and having a plan is so important. One thing that worked well for me was just forcing myself every week to do something with new people that would be initially uncomfortable and eventually built upon those experiences. For me, that was joining meetup groups. This is a website where you can find various conversations, various groups of people that get together, sometimes that talk about things you may or may not actually be that interested in. But to say, I want to improve my quality of life. I know that interpersonal bonds are one of the ways of doing this. Everyone that I knew at the time was busy in the hospital. And so this was a way of making new connections with people who had differing opinions, with people who had differing lives. But you got to make that commitment. You have to make that decision that you want to get out and start fostering those connections. And that's why coming back to the, the model we introduce in Brainwash, it may be really hard for a person to say, I'm going to go out and spend time with other people, even though they know that's what they want to do. It may be hard for them to put on those shoes and go to the gym or to eat the right foods. We need to set our brains up so those decisions are easier, those decisions we want to make. And so for an average person, that might mean you're doing okay on a couple of these things, but maybe it's the nature. That's the one that you really focus on because that'll give you that extra boost it takes to then make the decision to get out and spend time with more people. It may not be that you can force yourself to eat that healthy food that you know you should be eating, so you find a back door, and that back door might be, again, nature. Nature lowers your stress levels, makes your decision-making a little more rational, and now you can actually get yourself to eat that food that you know is good for you. So if I'm hearing you correctly, sometimes the pathway forward in an area of your life that you feel stuck on could be working on one of these other spokes. That's exactly right. Because you're working on your decision-making. Exactly right. That's great. You know, that really... I want to touch on one more of these areas that's so crucial because, and then I want to talk about, you talked about the plan and the roadmap that you've uh, listed out in the 10 day brainwash, which I think is worthwhile going through to help people understand how to actually make this happen and give them a little bit of a preview of what's in the book. But I want to talk about exercise because that's always one that people seem to struggle with. I know for myself, I've always tried different sorts of components and then found out that for myself, I really do need to work with somebody one-on-one or have like a friend that's kind of that I'm like training with. I go hiking, I go surfing, I do stuff with uh, a lot of the close friends in my life, but to really make serious progress on exercise, which was a priority for me, I need to work with somebody one-on-one. The first part of reclaiming these things that are hacking our health is understanding why they're so important. So what does the relationship, what's the relationship between exercise and our decision-making process? That's a phenomenal question. Look, we all know exercise is good for us. There's no one out there on podcast saying exercise less. And why is it good for us? Well, it improves basically every aspect of our health, from longevity to heart health. We want to focus on something different, and that is what does exercise do for our decision-making? And looking at these meta-analyses of both acute exercise and chronic exercise, exercise improves our executive functions. We haven't really talked about that as a term, but executive functions are this reflection of a a highly functional prefrontal cortex. Executive functions are things like cognitive flexibility, working memory, impulse control, attentional control. These are absolutely essential to making good choices. So if we can improve our executive functions by exercise, and that might mean going to the gym and going on the treadmill, or it might mean lifting weights, This is an entry point to better decision making. And I want to also comment on something you said, which is you do better working with another person. So important to experiment so that you can sustain the exercise. A lot of people, they say, I'm going to be now somebody who goes to the gym for an hour every single day. And they do it for a week or two weeks, and then they can't go for an hour, and then they're done. The goal with exercise is to make it an enjoyable experience. So I'd much rather have somebody go for a long walk with a friend then go to the gym for three days and say they're done. If they can do that long walk with a friend a few times a week and do that each week. Also, spending time with other people seems to amp up those executive improvements. So that's why I would say while you're trying to experiment with exercise, try to draft somebody else in. And that could be a friend, it could be a family member, it could even be a stranger. Some of these groups will have meetups where they meet out uh, on a hill or in a park and they do a simple walk together, but it's a goal to find a sustainable movement plan 
not exercise necessarily, but a movement plan. And if you can get out there and do those 20 to 30 minutes of aerobic exercise five times a week, fantastic. You know, that's what we know bumps up BDNF. There are all sorts of benefits that we'll get from that level of exercise. But if it's a question between staying on your couch and feeling upset because you couldn't go to the gym for an hour or just going for a walk around the neighborhood, it's always better to do some movement because again, we're looking at this from the perspective of improving decisions. And once you can consistently improve your decisions, you're going to increase the chances that you go to the gym or go on that walk. So it's just getting things moving in the first place. You know, Austin did mention BDNF, which I think really raises the notion <clears throat> of neuroplasticity, being able to actually structurally and functionally change the wiring of the brain. Dalai Lama said that the brain we develop reflects the life we lead. Mm. The life we lead are the choices we make. So if we choose to if we choose to look at negativity all the time, watching the news and seeing how everything is so threatening, then we are going to wire a brain that is a repository for fear and respond mm -hmm. to everything in a very fearful way. If we recognize the other side, the upside of neuroplasticity, that we can, the more we do something, the more indelible it becomes, the more we activate that pathway, then we take advantage of it to reconnect, to offset this whole disconnection syndrome and, and allow us to access that part of the brain that really tends to tamp down this us versus them mentality and allows us to appreciate other people's viewpoints. You know, these days, um, those darn Republicans or those horrible Democrats or, you know, my uh, New York Jets are so much, they're just a good team and the Miami Dolphins, whatever it is, you know, whether uh, it's Muslims and Jews and Catholics, everyone, you know, we put people in categories and we defend our positions and that defense of our place, our position is strengthened when we gravitate to those social media sites that play into that and strengthen that. And that's, not going to be sustainable for us anymore. We've got to rework this paradigm so that I can look at the world through your eyes and, and see what that's like. And uh, I may not agree with you, but at least we can make progress because now we're sharing ideas. We're not digging our feet and thinking this is the only way. I mean, you may have a, you may tell me the world is flat. I don't necessarily want to believe that, and I choose not to believe it. But you know what? Why don't you tell me why that may be the case? And let's kick it around. And I'll argue you know, the other side of the, of the possibilities, and then we'll come to some consensus. We so lack that today. I mean, you look around at what's going on, and it's certainly not serving us very well. It's almost like we've been infected by this disconnection virus. Yeah. And it's taken over. Syndrome, you're right. This disconnection syndrome. We've got this virus inside of us. We don't recognize it. We're blaming each other. We're fighting with each other. We're destroying the planet. And in the whole process, we're going to end up killing the host, which is ourselves, if we don't wake up and start to pay attention and pull ourselves out of it and see that we're not going to blame ourselves and feel guilty. The reason that I can't lose weight is because of me. I should feel guilty, shameful, et cetera, et cetera. No, these, these other things that have hijacked us, let's step out and begin to look at how we can slowly address them so we can take back control into our own lives. Well, that uh, mention just now of killing the host, uh, you know, is where this book eventually goes. I mean, it's been clearly demonstrated that those, in, uh, those uh, people who have higher connection to the prefrontal cortex have more concern, not just for other people, but for the environment and for the planet as well, are much more uh, pro-environment. Um, and interestingly, that uh, pro being or acting in a pro-environment way tends also to strengthen this connection. So uh, we're all in this together, and uh, you know I don't want to be a fatalist. And we're not being fatalistic at all. We're looking at the light at the end of the tunnel as to where we could and need to go. So there's so much incredible. One of the beautiful things about technology, there's so much accessibility to topics like this and conversations like this. There's also an influx of information and the person that's listening there today is making, trying to make decisions or making decisions and trying to understand how to prioritize so they can actually make progress in their life. One of the things that the book builds up to is a 10 day brain rush process that people can walk through. So when you were designing this process of a protocol, a plan that people could follow, how did you think about what is a priority that's gonna give people the biggest bang to have them go down the pathway and eventually lead to 
long lasting change. Well, good decisions beget good decisions. At, at the, the bottom, at the core of this whole thing, it's to say, if you can get to a threshold, which could actually be quite straightforward, where you start making slightly better decisions, that is a feed forward process. You will continue to make good decisions. The way we laid out this 10 day plan is we went through each of these factors, which are either taking us away from a brain that makes good decisions or helping us to rebuild a brain that makes good decisions and put them together in such a way that we increase the odds that anyone reading this book would get to this place of this feed forward process and continuing to make good decisions. The, the big themes with all of this are the reduction of chronic stress, the reduction of inflammation, and then improving things like sleep. And then finally, what can we do to actively influence this connection to the prefrontal cortex and to diminish the influence that the amygdala or amygdala processing has on our decisions? So we would try to make this as straightforward as possible when we already mentioned this time acronym, but it's things like that. It's easy steps that the reader can take to start reclaiming their decisions starting today. And while it is a 10 day plan and each day has different components, we feel strongly that any one of these pieces will already be enough to put somebody on the right track. We've talked about a lot of these things. We talked about sleep, for example, getting a better night's sleep will statistically improve your decision making the next day. And that might be the little bump that you need to then make a better dietary decision, to then make a better decision to spend time with friends and family. But again, as the 10 day plan is laid out, we walk through each of the topics that we've already discussed on this podcast and describe how to make that implementable into your life, starting with each sequential day. It builds upon itself. So the first day you might be changing up your digital interactions, applying that time acronym. And then you might say, well, how can I have more empathy in my day? And then you might say, how can I do some more nature in my, ba- my day? And none of this is too complicated. These are things people know, but we really believe that as a whole, when you put this together, it will give the reader what they need to finally overcome that hurdle and start making consecutive and consistent better decisions. And, you know, ultimately it does become an aggregate kind of thing. I mean, uh, you know, you can implement the plan and you could be uh, full out uh, on a ketogenic diet for, for the past three years, really doing your best. You know, that's really helping you reduce inflammation, targeting your insulin sensitivity, et cetera. But you may be sleeping five hours a night. So that might be the cog in uh, for you that really matters most. So we outline each of the components, why they're important, and then it's really ultimately a bit of personalized medicine here. You know, what does Drew specifically need? Well, maybe, uh, you know, it sounds like you got the exercise thing in hand, you're working out with somebody, uh, but I, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's sleep for you, maybe it's diet, uh, maybe it's reconnecting to other people, maybe it's meditation, uh, maybe it's expression of gratitude. These things are all extremely valuable. And, you know, in getting to the expression of gratitude each day by journaling, by writing down things that you are grateful for, that fosters empathy. And guess what? Empathy is a manifestation of prefrontal cortex activity. And therefore, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together. You're going to ultimately wire more aggressively to that part of your brain. And that's what we're looking for. You know, this interview is coming out the week that the book is out. And it's January and January has so much weight for individuals because January is often the time that people are going forward, especially a lot of listeners of this podcast. They have New Year's resolutions. They have things that they want to make progress in. And in the context of deciding what to focus on, there's always the weight of the years where things didn't go the way they wanted to. And for the person that's out there, that's listening, that's tried a lot of things and has maybe been unsuccessful at some in the past in their life. For that person who's listening right here, right now, what would you want to tell them when it comes to thinking about implementing these things into their life and moving forward? Well, I think it gets back to uh, why have you failed so, so many times? And it's not because of lack of information. By and large, the books, the programs people are looking at are pretty darn good. You know, we know most of these authors and they write good stuff. But it's the action part, it's the implement, implementation and staying with that decision, making the commitment that no one's really looked at until now. No one's really asked, why is it that I can't stick with this program? And we have such a high rate of recidivism as it relates to going back to these maladaptive behaviors, eating the wrong food, 
giving up on your gym membership or your commitment to meeting with other people, et cetera. So that's what we're focused on. And yeah, I mean, right now it, the book's coming out January, new year, new you. Uh, but it's not about um, what the decisions are. It's how you make those decisions that finally need some scrutiny. And it, it's, that's, uh, that's where we can come in and really help because it, it's really so important that people stop this self-blame Gosh, I can't stick with that program. Something is wrong with me. Why am I, you know, such a bad person that I can't I I can't help myself and I eat those wrong foods. Again, it's important to recognize how the deck is stacked against making good decisions. Once you recognize that, then uh, you're in a position of power. You are empowered then to say this isn't going to happen to me anymore and I'm going to take control and that's what the guide is all about. It's about finally regaining, putting that adult back in the room and making better decisions. And let me just boil this down to a simple analogy. Here you are at the start of this year and you're looking out over this lake and you see the other side. That's where you need to go. That's your goal. That goal might be losing weight. It might be spending more time with family. It might be lowering your blood pressure. And you're in this boat that you want to use to get to the other side of the lake. And that boat is your brain. It's the thing that's going to get you there. But the boat is filled with holes. So until you fix the boat, you're not getting to the other side of the lake. And what we're talking about is fixing the boat. It's building a boat, a brain, that is going to get you there safely so you can stay and reach your goals. Yeah, and and I'll tell you... um here we are still you know, prior to publication of, of Brainwash and the fact that 11 countries around the world have opted in. You know, they're, they're publishing this book now prior, uh, you know, agreeing to do this without ever even seeing, uh, you know, the American edition is uh, I've never been in an experience like that before. So uh, um, I, I think that it's time that, uh, you know, people value each other. And I think that's our message is that Again, we're all in this together, and we need to reconnect. We need to offset every manifestation or uh, nuance of the term disconnection syndrome, not just the the straightforward uh, neurophysiology part of being disconnected from the prefrontal cortex, but the whole notion of us being all disconnected from each other. We can make great things happen if we value each other, if we embrace diversity and recognize that if we all pull on the oars at the same time together, we're going to move down, we're going to move down the the river that you mentioned earlier. Mm. Powerful, a powerful closing message. Brainwash, detox your mind for clear thinking, deeper relationships and lasting happiness. It's out now and you can find the link inside of the show notes. How can our listeners continue to follow the journey and participate and any other shout outs that you want to give for the book? (laughs) Well, easiest place to find us is brainwashbook.com. And we'll be posting all sorts of new materials, blogs, videos. We're on this journey with you. We're still trying to figure it out. We know this is the right way forward, but it takes ongoing commitment. And as my dad said, we're all in it together. So that's the spot to reach out to us, to connect with us, and to see what we're up to, to see what the latest research shows about how to reverse disconnection syndrome. I do have some social accounts. My Instagram is at Austin Perlmutter, and my Twitter is at Austin Pearl MD. And I am at David Perlmutter MD on Facebook, and uh, have Instagram accounts as well. But I think, I, I think the best place to connect with me is Dr. Perlmutter, Doctor We have robust science, and it's searchable. All the stuff that we talk about is posted in its full PDF form. The research articles are all available, and uh, you know, we, we, we see there's a lot of interaction there, so I would like to foster that. Well, on the note of gratitude, Austin, David, I want to thank you both for coming here and being on our podcast and sharing with our listeners this incredible body of work that father and son team duo using both all the experience that you've had and all the new experiences that you're bringing into the table, Austin, and putting together a practical program for people to follow to better their lives and really getting to the source of actually what's there. We give a lot of attention in the space of wellness to food. Food is sometimes very controversial. It's a fun thing to talk about. It's easy. It's something that we all do today, every day. And while it's so important, I often find that there's these other topics that actually could have people make 
much more progress inside of the space of food if they care about that, like connecting with other people and getting better night's rest. And they don't get enough credit. And I appreciate you both for giving them the credit that they deserve. Andrew, I, I, speaking for the two of us, very grateful for these opportunities over the years and this opportunity today uh, to you know have the platform to get out uh, the information that we think is really important. And just for doing the podcast in general, the conversations like the one we're having right now are so important so that we can understand other people's perspectives. And this entire world of digital technology, while it has its downsides, has provided us with exactly this so that we can have this conversation, so that other people can hear this conversation, and so that we can all learn. So thank you. Absolutely. Appreciate you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.